and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That tells us what he has come for, doesn't it? He's come to bring sinners into the, to the fold. Praise God. And then go to the 24th chapter, verses 11 through 13. And Jesus speaking here, and he says, let's all read. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You want to endure to the end? <laughs> it's not the f first mile. It's important because if there never was a first mile, there'd never be a last one, would they? But we need to endure to the end. Brother Lucas, praise God. Whoa, there we go. All right, now we we popped everyone's eardrums like we're landing in at the airport now. Scared us all to death. Everybody's blood pressure and heart rate's up, so we're all alive. I hope, let me see. Yeah, nobody had a heart attack. Do you think of a particular person? It's not a hard one, guys. Jesus, all right. All right, anyone else? When I think of loyalty... A lot of times I think of, besides Jesus, which is one I wrote down, but how about your spouse? How about a friend? How about a friend? According to the book, Why Loyalty is... Wow. Rubbing against stuff, making noise, bro. Right? All right. According to a book, Why Loyalty Matters, research indicates that 
the number and the quality of friendships for the average American has been declining since 1985. In fact, 25% of Americans report having no friends in whom they can confide in of things that are important to them. And the average total number of confidants per person is only two. When just 20 years ago, it was at least three. So within our lifespan, some folks have went from three to none. Some research says it has a lot to do with social media and Facebook. And there was a seen a commercial a long time ago. This young girl is sitting there. She has over 4,000 Facebook friends. She goes, and all mom and dad do. Says, what, what, what is it mom and dad do? I don't never know that they're doing anything. Well, mom and, while she's on the web, mom and dad are out socializing and going places and speaking and talking to people. So this new, this new generation at times tends to, yes sir, this tends to focus so much on maybe social media that they really don't know what a true friend is. That is some of the thought process there. But a friend or a confidant is a person in whom that you can share good times with, bad times with, times of pain and sorrow in life in general. Like we had said, I, my spouse I've shared life's journey with, intimate times with, fearful times with. I've probably shared everything across the board with my wife. Family you share history with, but a friend, a true friend, you have a confidant in. Now, I'm not saying that your spouse is not your confidant, but there's sometimes that you just need someone else to talk to besides your spouse. I'm, I'm looking to see what reaction I'm getting to know which way I need to go when the lesson's over with. <laughs> but it is true. Sometimes a guy needs a guy, and sometimes a lady needs a lady to talk to. And that's where a good friend and a confidant comes into place. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In one of my apostolic uh, commentaries, I looked it up early this morning when I got up, and I was thinking about this scripture. And it says this, This proverb is often quoted to illustrate the necessity of, of being friendly in order to gain friends and perhaps that is a valid application but more accurate understanding in the context seems to mean that someone who has friends will find it necessary to practice friendship with them even when it may not be convenient that is the consequence of having friends is the obligation to be a friend have you, ever, have you ever felt like that? The phone rings and, man, you just know you're going to be on the phone for a while. You love this person. They're your friend. But, but see, out of love and obligation, you pick the phone up and you listen and you talk and you share a need. The latter part of the proverb seems to bear out this meaning. Genuine friendship are more loyal. Genuine friendships are more loyal and concerned and helpful than physical brothers. The test of true friendship comes when it is comfortable, I'm, I'm sorry, when it is not comfortable, not convenient, or profitable to the friend. That's when you know you have a true friend, when they will listen and you know, you know, this is what I'm about ready to bear is not going to profit them, but they stay in there. They hang, hang in there with you. They pray with you. And they share whatever need that you have. That is the sign of a loyal and true friend. All right. Matthew, or what his name really was before his conversion, was Levi. He was a tax collector. 
Bible calls him a publican, but he was a tax collector. How many, how many of you have friends that's a tax collector? Do any of you know one? I know one. I really don't have a whole lot, to, really never had a whole lot to say to him back then. Would you like me to change to the portable mic? Um, so, and in his day, the government taxed all commodities that was transported along the trade routes and those of local merchants. His job required him to keep abreast of the value of wool, linen, pottery, brass, silver, gold, barley, whatever there was to sell. He was supposed to have a good idea of its worth. Why? So he could tax it. He had good communicative skills. He could communicate with people, especially when it comes time to say, hey, your tax bill's due, and it's this much. It's not hard to act like that when you have the full rate weight of the Roman government behind you, which was the largest, largest, strongest government in the world at that time. You know, you're probably sitting there thinking, some of you are, well, this is all interesting, but where are you going with this? Well, let me just elaborate a little bit more. Publicans were Jewish citizens. who pledged loyalty to the Roman government in exchange for political appointments. So Levi, or later known as Matthew, he collected taxes from his fellow Jewish brethren. But it went a little further than that. He just didn't collect taxes. He added a surcharge for himself. I mean, come on. The guy's got to make a living, right? Got to make a living. So he would tack on a little extra for himself. And as a result, the Jews hated publicans. Now, does anybody in here, can you truly say that you love the tax man? <laughs> Thank you, sister. I'm with you all the way. I'm with you all the way. And they're getting ready to lower the boom on us and let us know that our taxes are going to go up a little bit more because of some of the new laws that's went in. And not only that is... Well, you're just going to have to wait about two to three weeks longer to get your return than what you used to. Lord knows the government needs some extra money off the interest, so come on. Let's suck it up. Let's be loyal to our government. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I hear some mumbling and groaning over here. So understand that he had to pledge loyalty and allegiance to Rome. And it even went a little bit further than that. You see, he had to turn his back on his loyalty and allegiance to the God of his fathers. You see, when a Jew was never supposed to pledge loyalty to anyone but God. So who was Matthew's friends or Levi's friend friends? Probably other publicans government officials, and actually, if you've been around any of them, uh, my brother Mike and myself have been around um, some politicians and been around several wannabe politicians, and they're even worse than the real politicians. They're really not anybody's friend, but their own. They're in it for themselves. So you see, Levi was in his business of collecting taxes for himself. Because if he probably could have skimmed from the government, he would have, but I'd imagine he's probably more afraid of Rome than he was the Jews. So understand that Matthew had a lot of self-interest in his job. Now understand that living near Capernaum, he probably knew or seen Peter, James, John, even Andrew, because they all lived in that area. And there's probably a good chance that he had seen or even heard Jesus <coughs> as he spoke. But you see, the Bible says that one day, 
one day, Jesus came by. He came by the tax collection table. He came by Mr. H&R Block. He came by Mr. IRS. And we all love them. And he looked at him and said, follow me. You see, I believe that, that as I read through some commentaries and, and the, the, the lesson, he had to have heard Jesus. Everyone that was in Capernaum heard Jesus. And he may have even caught something in his ear that Jesus or that one of his disciples had spoken. And what did the Bible say that he did? <coughs> that he just dropped everything he did and he followed him. Understand that in that one moment of meeting with Jesus, the one encounter, all of a sudden, his loyalty shifted from Rome and self to Jesus and a cause. To Jesus and a cause that was greater than himself. Now, the, the Bible speaks that not long after Matthew's conversion, he hosted a feast. And we, read the, we read it in the, in the text. He hosted a feast, and, and Jesus and his disciples was there, and his public and friends. Well, oh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Who else would you invite but people that you knew? Oh, that's great. And um, publicans and sinners came. They sat and they was talking to Jesus. Pharisees. Pharisees. Scribes. They, they went to the disciples and said, What is your master doing? He's sitting and eating and talking and sharing with publicans and sinners. Well, to a Jew, a publican, well, you know, they hated him. So what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response said, wait a minute now. Does a doctor come to well people? A doctor goes to sick people. I came to save the sinners. I came to save them which was lost. And the truth of the matter is, the Pharisees needed to have a sit down with Jesus themselves just as much or maybe more than the publicans did. We may touch on that here in just a little bit more. The disciples of Capernaum accepted Matthew without hesitation. Matthew served alongside men who at one time would have held him at arm's length. Their loyalty to Jesus became the common bond that fused them together and erased the differences that once existed. When someone new comes into the church, it is my responsibility to see to their needs. It is my responsibility to forge the bond that will strengthen and bind us together. Do you feel the same way? It's my responsibility. It's time that I was sitting there, and I think it's time that I took this personally. It's time that I looked in the mirror and said, Hey, Luke, are you doing? That was an old nickname, sorry. Hey, Lucas, are you doing what I've asked you to do? Are you doing what I did? Sometimes we need to start taking the Word of God personally and say, I'm going to do what Jesus did because that is the blueprint that he left for me. My loyalty to God requires that I be loyal to His cause. I must sacrifice my own personal comfort and my own opinion. Now, believe it or not, that's, I don't want to shock nobody, but sometimes that can be hard for me to do. I didn't get a whole lot of laughs. Either you're all tired of hearing stuff like that, or you just know. <laughs> do what? We're, no, they're listening for, for that last one. Sister Lucas isn't here. You can't run and tell her nothing. She's sick. 
So you see, I must, it's my own personal comfort and my own opinion that I must lay aside so that I can accomplish the work that God has sent us to do, has sent me to do. If I am only interested in the people who I share an opinion with and speak to only those whose lifestyles I approve with, then I have overlooked the very ones that Jesus died to save. I have overlooked the very ones that Jesus died to save. Matthew 9 and 13 says, and they don't have this, I just give them just a couple of verses, that in the New Living Translation, for I have came, I, for I had come to not, I've come not to those who think, who think that they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You, you have to understand that we can't give up on those who think they're righteous and not. Have you ever tried to convince someone that they were wrong and you had the evidence to back it up and they would not even look at it? How do you reach people like that? Do you give up on them? We can't give up on them. But we, but we can go on and we can see those who know they need help. Who know they need help from God. Who know they are, they are, they are on their last leg. They, they are, they've spent their last dime. They, they are on their last nerve. They, they have no hope. They were the ones that know that they need something and are willing to accept. Them are the ones that we should go to. Don't forget the ones who think they got it all. They got it all whipped. You know, the, the Pharisees, buddy, they... What are you talking about? Me? Me speak to a publican or a, a sinner like that? Oh, whoo, no, not me. Whoa. They're, they're full of dead men's bones. They're, the insides stink. Because they're not doing what... God wants them to do. It's awful quiet in here. Sister Julian, you're right. They're awful quiet today. She just come in the back, back door. All right. Loyalty to God means so much more than just coming to church. I'm going to shock you now. It means a whole lot more than just paying your tithes. Putting a little bit in the offering plate and and paying your build my church. Well, Brother Lucas, what do you mean? It's more than that. It's so much more than that. It's being faithful and obedient to His Word. If we don't build on the truth, then our work truly is in vain. If I don't become obedient and faithful to His Word, then a lot of things that concern me won't be answered. Because I am not interjecting myself into the Word as I read it. I am not using it for a mirror so it can show the things that I need to change. And if I'm not sharing it with someone outside these walls, I am looking over the people that He died to save. I don't want to give up on those. I want to keep trying to get those who think that they're all right and not. All right, are we here? Let me catch up with myself here. All right, so I want to become obedient and faithful to His Word. A lot of things that I'm concerned about will fall into place. In other words, I must be loyal to the Word and the cause of Christ. I must let it get in here and do something to me. I must let it get in here and cause a hunger for lost souls. I needed to get in here and say, hey, you need to be loyal not only to God, but you need to be loyal to my cause. What is his cause? Save those that are lost. Save those that are lost. Build and strengthen the kingdom of God. So we must be loyal to the lost. 
And what that means is we must pray for those that are lost. Be diligent in showing them Christ's love in our lives. My life must show people around me the love of Christ. That means when they cut me off, I don't yell at them and tell them, Hey, you're awful stupid. Where'd you get your driver's license? From a Cracker Jack box? Not that I've ever done anything like that. <laughs> but they must see the love of God in my life that shines forth to them. You see, because the cause that I am living for is to see the lost saved. Wouldn't it be a shame if we had to have two services? Wouldn't it be a shame if we had to have a service in the morning Sunday school in between where everybody can come and then another service afterwards. Oh, that would just break my heart. Wouldn't break my heart. Wouldn't break my heart. That's what God thrives, is, is, is thirsty for us to get a hold of. Is the loyalty to Him is the loyalty to see the lost saved. The loyalty to Him is also to show our brothers and sisters in the Lord the loyalty to them so that we can have a bond, a solid bond with one another. You see, a threefold cord is a whole lot stronger than one. You can take the sharpest knife you want, and if you've got 10,000 threads making a rope, you're not just going to cut through it like butter. But you can just take it and lay it on one thread and it goes through. We need to be bound together. So that when the devil rushes in, he can't do anything to us. We just stand against him. All right. We need to invite these folks to church. We need to invite everybody to church. Everybody we see. Everybody we come in contact, we have a conversation with. Invite them to church. I was talking yesterday to some folks at Brother Cecil's funeral, and I, I was inviting them to come to church. Folks we hadn't seen in a long time. We're praying for you. We want you to come. Come see it. Man, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even recognize the place. If you'd been in it when it was a gym, come on by, because you'll never believe what we turned it into. Well, what's it look like? Because ah, you just have to come and see. Just dangle the carrot. You catch fish by teasing them. Come up. You know. I guess you can jump in there, but I've never caught one like that. Dangle the carrot. Tell them how much you love them, how much you miss them. Every time I get online with brother, or get on... Facebook with, with with Brother Latham, I tell him, hey, we're praying for you. We miss you. We miss you in church. I mean, I know he has a situation with his grandson. But, you know, still we can pray and love those that are that, that are fellow brothers, but we need to have the same love and compassion for those of your best friends that you haven't met yet. The one that will be sitting next to you one of these days. We need to have that same love and compassion. So invite them to church. Share the word of God with them. Love them. Love them. Because God loves you. Because God has taken the time to pull you out of where you was at. Trust me, I ain't no better than nobody else in this room. And probably some folks better than me in this room. But I just love God and He loved me. That's what it's all about, is the love of God. The fact that when we share the love with them, and we invite people to church, and we bring them in here, and they feel what we have here, oh, man, I told you, I shared it, I shared it with you. I told somebody, I said, listen, he goes, I'm not going to come. I said, yeah, but I'm just going to keep inviting you. I said, because I tell you what, if you come and you don't feel anything, I'll never ask you again. you got to be honest with me, though. If you tell me after service you didn't feel a thing, I'll never ask you again. You know what's amazing is even Wednesday night, we feel the move of God. If you, if you don't come on Wednesday night, I know some folks have to work, but you're missing something. And there's a spirit of God that moves here on Wednesday night. Shock, isn't it? On Bible study night. Oh, continuing education, I'm sorry. God wants us to share His love and His word with this generation that is lost. All right. Check my time here real quick. 
All right. Now, God does have His church, and in it, it's, the, the church is ordained. That's you and I. To be His body and to complete His mission here on earth. Loyalty to truth includes being faithful to God's plan for His church and to reach the lost. God has put a system of leadership within His church that operates under Him. That operates under Him. So loyalty to the truth requires our loyalty to the leaders that God has ordained and put in place. True leaders do not demand submission to their own philosophies and ideas. But they follow what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also follow Christ. Loyalty is not blind submission but it is realizing, as Matthew, the tax collector, demonstrated, that serving the kingdom is more important than serving self. And that in order to find our place, we must submit to the authority God has placed in our lives. Our loyalty to our leaders, then, is not just loyalty to them, but it is when we submit to them, we are submitting to God. You can see that in Romans, the 13th chapter, if you want to jot that down. But understand this, that at the end of the age, not only will God, God's people, reap the rewards of their loyalty and their faithfulness and enjoy the wonders of heaven, but they will enter triumphantly into that holy city. You see, there's going to come a day. If the Lord tarries, there's going to come a day that Brother Julian will bury me. I want to go into heaven rejoicing. I want to go into heaven triumphantly, knowing that I, that I was loyal to the cause of Christ, that I was loyal to Him and, and loyal to the church and loyal to my leadership. I want to do whatever God would have me do. And that means that I must be loyal to my church and to God. I must take the Word of God and put it into my life and let it grow and let it, and, and let it just, just sit there and simmer. You know, have you, have you ever fixed a big pot of chili? And it's good. Man, I fixed some last week. Man, it was good. I fixed it all, put it together, stuck it in a crock pot. Man, that bad boy was good. I hadn't bowled for anybody got home. But you know what? It was even better the next day. You know, when you let the Word of God kind of sit, and you let it kind of simmer a little bit, and you go back to it, all of a sudden, other things start coming up to your mind. You see, we have to let that loyalty of God just kind of sit and grow, that we can build upon the truth, because we get that from the Word of God. All right. Matthew 24 and 13 says, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. I want to challenge you. Let's be loyal to the Word of God and to His cause. But I want one thing. I want us to do it together. I want us to do it together. I want the Bible church to be a loyal, strong family. A loyal, strong family. I want us to grow strong bonds between one another. I want this section over here to know that section over here. We're not that big, folks. We're really not. Not yet! Not yet! We're not. So let's get to know one another. Let's find loyalty. Let's find that loyalty that the disciples had. That their, their strong bonds of loyalty were, were cemented by the love that they had in Jesus Christ. Any thoughts? Any comments? Come on. Got an awful lot of smart people out there just be sitting going, oh, you're okay. You did okay.
I know he's awake because they turned the mic on like scared me to, right out of this chair. All right. All right. Let's be loyal to God. You know, we was talking about spouses and, and friends. You know, there, there's things that I have shared with friends that, that I just wouldn't share with no one else. Why? Because I have a loyalty to them. There's things that I've talked to Brother Julian about that I probably wouldn't talk with anyone else about. You know, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Brother Julian, is probably closer to me than my own blood. Why? Because we forged a bond years ago together. And I thought it was kind of ironic because, you know, I'm older than he is. I know you don't believe that. I know that's not how it looks. I'm not even looking over here. Because I'm going to get in trouble anyway. But... But we 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 just we forged that 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 kinship and that loyalty kind of right off the bat, and it was just something of, of great to have that with someone. If you don't have that with someone, you need to find it, and you'll find it in the church if you'll just reach out to someone else. We need to reach out to one another, know them, love them. Let's be loyal to one another, but let's be loyal to the cause of Christ. Be loyal to your church. Be loyal to the Word. And let it find its way in your heart. God bless you. Love you.